Hello and welcome to this English episode of the Dutch Reenactor. This episode will be in English because we have once again a guest from abroad in our episode. And this is Patrick. Hello. Hi, Patrick. Uh, nice uh, that you that you are able to be here. And uh, for our audience, some of you might know Patrick as the owner of Verlagkopf. And Verlagkopf or webshops owners in particular Verlagkopf is what we are going to talk about today. Um, so for the people who don't know me, my name is Ravel. And I'm not sure where you can currently find me on the background image because if everything is okay, we have a new background image. Um, also thanks to Patrick. Um, but um, in the previous episodes, you could have found, found me on the left side of the image. And then we also have Bjorn. Yes, here. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And normally you would have been able to find him on the right side, mm -hmm. but also not sure where he is right now. <laughs> <laughs> We will see uh, uh, when the when the episode is done, uh, how it turns out. So that's also a surprise for us. Then the disclaimer uh, with which we always start our episode. In this podcast, we distance ourselves from any association with fascism or similar organizations. And in this podcast, we only proclaim our own opinions and not that of our units. And then off to the start of our webshop owner, Patrick. I have known Patrick now through the internet for at least since October 2018. I have researched this, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I discovered that we started talking at uh, around this time. But I have the feeling that we knew each other longer than that. But, well, maybe my, my memory is wrong. Well, yeah, it sounds like three years, like like too short a period for our long conversations, but it might be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we, we know each other. Uh, um, well, we, we've never met in real life, but I feel like I know you. <laughs> um, but the audience doesn't know you, so maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. At first, thank you very much for inviting me into your podcast. Actually, this is my first time being podcasted, so it's a great honor uh, about me. I'm a 30 years old programmer and former researcher in domain of informatics and information technologies, and now a head of COP Solutions, which includes four different branches oh. that support history. Yeah. It's a typical story of a guy so embedded in a hobby that it became a work and also it became a lifestyle. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that's quite interesting. And that's why we invited you here to talk about this. So um, uh, you are from Slovakia, right? Yeah, exactly. And this is also something uh, we have to remember because often people say you are from Czechia, right? Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> But that's not right. <laughs> no, not quite <laughs> right. We live in Bratislava in Slovakia and this was mm -hmm. formerly called Presburg for centuries. In the past, uh, it was a city with a large representation of Germans, Hungarians, and also Czechs. Uh, that is also the place we promote as where our company is located. Every time you see our logo, Ferla Kopf, it is connected with Pressburg and Karlsdorf district. And that is the place where our office is uh, placed. And that's also the, when you, when you see your logo, you also have a city on it. That's also the yeah, old he... uh, uh, town view of Pressburg, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, cool. Quite interesting. Yeah, that's something uh, not everybody might know. So uh, good for us uh, to know this right now. And uh, yeah, interesting. So how did you get involved into this hobby? Well, this involvement into hobby was very great. Well, from childhood, when we collected and repaired old helmets and watched war movies as kids, then maybe through computer games like Call of Duty, Uh, I became more and more interested in, in uh, history. And finally, probably by buying Airsoft guns, which led us to found the historical Airsoft group in 2010. Uh, then we started with simple but authentic uh, Wehrmacht kit. And later, when we got more equi uh, equipment, we bought blank firing rifles to attend first trainings and reenactment events in uh, 2012. In that time, our small group was already transformed to official non-profit organization with five members. And that was my start. 
Okay, so uh, to summarize, you started with uh, Airsoft and then uh, you came into reenactment uh, two years later. Yeah, exactly. And was this already with uh, KVH Feldkra? Yeah, that was the non-profit organization that we established in about 2011. Yeah, okay. And and were you one of the founders? Yeah, I was, yes. Okay, okay, interesting. We were, we were three guys really interested in history, so we found our own organization because mm-hmm. in that time there wasn't like... Um, good situation for joining other other organizations we we were lucky to join them so we found uh, our own but but are there any other organizations well at least were there any organ other organizations in that time frame in in slovakia yeah they were and they still are are about maybe we count about 20 or 30 uh, different oh. organizations okay uh, all are portraying the Wehrmacht side or also allied and they are focused on Second World War, but uh, different sides. Okay. So I was just, just scared of 20, 20 Wehrmacht units. Oh, no, we don't have a lot <laughs> in the Netherlands, but <laughs> but if you, indeed if it's from all sides, then then uh, I think the situation wouldn't be that dissimilar from what we have over here. Yeah, I, f- I think it's comparable. Yeah, yeah. So why did you decide to portray the Wehrmacht unit and not go for the Allies, for example? <laughs> well, this is a very common question, and uh, I think that the most interesting part was the precision of the German units and and uh, the most common units as as the Wehrmacht were. Were probably it was really the the st- uh, strat- strategies and uh, precision of German army that uh, impressed us the most. Yeah, okay, and that's why you decided to do that direction of the Second World War. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and how did you start off? Did you have a smooth start or was it difficult? And uh, what was most important for your group? Where did you focus on? Well, well, from the start we were uh, representing infantry units of uh, 76 Infantry Division. Mm-hmm. Uh, we portray a complete MG squad, uh, but of course we started at, uh, with three or four members and uh, later we got the complete squad. And this squad is, uh, has proper equipment and uh, well, the, this MG squad is our only impression we train and display. And we also control some anti-tank ga- guns and accessories. And now we have about 14 active members, which is always sufficient to build a complete squad. Okay, that uh, <laughs> sounds like a good group, yes. Anti-tank guns even. <laughs> yeah, some Panzerfaust, which are pretty famous in our, our group, and also a Panzer Shrek from the last event. Ah, uh-huh. interesting. Yeah, and um, so, yeah, we will also put some advertisement up for KVH Feldkrau. Um, so if there are any uh, Slovakian people uh, listening to this podcast, uh, go to their website and you will find more information. Um, are you recruiting? Um, yeah, we always try to recruit mainly the young members because the history is so important and it's uh, also important to catch these young people as soon as possible to stay, stay in this topic and uh, to put some effort and time uh, for our common history. Okay, so so if you're a Slovakian and, and you want to join, you can find me- more information uh, on their website. And uh, as I said, we have put the image up in the background. And of course, also in the uh, description below. Yes, of course. Yes. We will put also the link in the description below. So one more general question. What is the reenactment si- scene like in Slovakia? Because in the Netherlands, we... Um, well, trouble would be... Uh, uh, a big word, but sometimes we have a bit of trouble in portraying Wehrmacht units. Mm-hmm. Um, how is it like in Slovakia? Do people have difficulties with this or is well, it okay? In contrary, I would say that the location of our country, also the authentic historical places where it was fought, also weapon legislation and public interest makes Slovakia a paradise for enactment <laughs> because dozens of public and private events have taken place here in the last 15 years each with hundreds of participants and dozens of vehicles 
and also also brutal pyrotechnic uh, equipment. Maybe I am wrong, wow. but I haven't seen such magnificent pyro effects anywhere else. So the situation here is pretty pretty good. <laughs> that's that's a nice de description. Uh, Reenactors paradise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can maybe some listeners will be doing it, but I'm salivating already at the idea of of having it so easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah yeah so so maybe we should join you once <laughs> in slovakia <laughs> maybe that's where we all should go <laughs> okay but that's good to hear that's that's also a, a good way to grow your group and not have any um, trouble in expanding which we uh, do have in the netherlands so yeah, but but it's true that, that there might be some troubles with uh, weapons legislation uh, yeah. due, due to the overall changes in in how uh, uh european union look at this topic mm -hmm. but uh, we will see in the in, in the near future yeah that's also yeah that's always something you have to be aware of of course because of the europe european union um yeah we can't say anything about that we just have to wait how it turns out and uh, let's hope that it doesn't destroy our hobby mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean uh, uh... It, it differs from country to country, and I do know that they want to uh, level everything, but I still hope that we can keep the differences that we have, because otherwise it doesn't look very good for us. Yeah, or maybe changes for the good. Uh, that's also possible, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in some cases, it looks like it will change to, uh, to do better, but mm -hmm. in mo most cases, it's uh, even harder to obtain a weapon uh, with new legislation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. We we have that as well here. Yeah, uh, difficulties in obtaining a, a, a weapon, um, even finding one is difficult. Um, even though in Germany there are many carabines still available, but to get them in the Netherlands, that's a problem, mostly. So, yeah, let's hope that will uh, become better in the future. I don't think so. I don't think so. But <laughs> on to the next topic, because I don't want to get stuck on this end. <laughs> yeah. So now about Verlagkopf. We're very curious about that. Um, why and how did you start Verlagkopf? Well, in fact, first products were made purely for upgrading my own impression. And these were probably the Shoka Cola stickers or some matchboxes or postcards. Mm -hmm. I remember also we started with Arbeitsbuch document because it was a big challenge in that time and it wasn't planned as a further product, only as a challenge. And then we printed also some night nice Bilgebrechers uh, that were pretty popular and that was it. An initial portfolio that attracted other people as well and soon we launched eShop in 2016. So this was the start. Yeah, and... and and so your first product were, were the Coca cola stickers. Yeah, one one of the first. It's very very hard to remember now all the all the products because in that time we we tried to make different things. But I checked history, and our first eShop customer <laughs> in 2016 was from Netherlands. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, and he bought some Coca cola stickers. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> we won't do it but i'm almost tempted to, to figure out who it was but <laughs> yeah yeah so maybe outside of the podcast you can tell us who who it was <laughs> or, or if he's listening you can put his name out below <laughs> yeah yeah maybe he can say i i do remember being the first customer <laughs> yeah so uh 2016 and and yeah like you said to upgrade your your own stuff at first and then uh you discovered that more people were interested in your products and that you were quite handy in making your own things. Yes, exactly. As a, yeah. as a former webmaster and graphic uh, designer, this was one of one of my duties to make, make these um, items for our group. So mm -hmm. that was the start and soon it, it uh, spread it among other uh, groups and associations and then we go online. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, um, so when when did Verlagkopf really became uh, a company? Was that also in 2016 or? Uh, no, it it, be, uh, it it happened just uh, last year. Oh, we, yeah. Okay. We we found it uh, 
official company because it was no longer only a hobby, but a full-time job. So we did the proper measures <laughs> for, for selling stuff. And that was the time when we launched the COP Solutions Limited, an official company that covers our different branches, all of okay. our branches. Yeah, I, I understand because you were also using the name Verlagkov earlier, but it was not registered as an official company back then. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. But but when did you first start to use the name Verlagkov? Hmm, that's a tough question. I think that might be about 2015 or 16 when we launched eShop. I can't remember exactly because my uh, Kopf acronym or Kopf name came from a reenactment impression. And that's why we started it like uh, like company name also. And then it spread and we stayed and we keep with this name because it's already pretty famous. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, also, of course, an uh, important thing of branding to keep your name so people can recognize you. So, okay, so you already started the name Verlagkopf because it was your reenactment name. Yeah, and now it looks like that the Verlagkopf, which is one of the <laughs> our most famous branch, uh, is our flagship also. Then we also have a Werkstattkopf, which represents more technological-oriented products mm -hmm. made mostly by welding or, or uh, maybe 3D print. And then we also have a Militia T-shirts uh, branch, which is dedicated for commercial adver uh, advertisement. And yeah. the most interesting for me is the newest branch, which is Ring Groups. Uh, that is a private platform for co connecting all history lovers without modern policies. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are also on uh, Re-N Re Groups. Um, uh, you can compare it uh, with Facebook, right? It's a social media platform. Uh, you can compare it by means of functionality and uh, no by means of uh, policies. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. True, true. Uh, yeah. The policies are quite different because, of course, Facebook doesn't allow uh, much um, Wehrmacht stuff on their platform. And uh, Reend Groups is, of course, more free in that regard. Yes, as we see it, uh, since the turn of the millennium, we all notice how politics affects the presentation of history. Mm -hmm. Also, we know that fact sharing in text or image is an easy target for automated algorithms. And whole groups of uh, groups of people and also expert content have disappeared from social networks in the rest yeah. recent years because it suddenly didn't meet the conditions of companies that run social networks. And that's why we bring our own platform to replace the old political ones. And we hope also that Ring Group's network can be a new place for market, event organizations and sharing experiences from the front battlefield. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. I mean, I've, I've seen, uh, uh, well, uh, German, uh, Japanese, uh, Italian, but also allied uh, American, British um, groups on Facebook being the target of the new uh, policies which they have, which includes, of course, the uh, the famous, uh, we would call them windmills in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, which are always selected by the uh, automated algorithms, but also the uh, images of weapons and everything else is also slowly uh, being added to the uh, automated algorithms to be removed. And a lot of groups have already three or four incarnations. Um, because the previous ones have been banned and I don't I think it's going to get worse in the future while well, there is nothing behind it which they really want to target yeah we have been targeted as well uh, yeah. our group die because mm -hmm. um, well we were once putting up a picture I, I, I well it was just a picture of two helmets I, I don't see what was wrong about it <laughs> but we received restrictions on our page from mm. Facebook and we also can't get rid of it. So this prevents us from spreading uh, or, or, or making other people um, familiar with our group because Facebook blocks that. So yeah, yeah I think another platform like Rian Groups would really be a solution. Um, the problem in the past has always been that uh, other groups didn't pick up popularity yet so let's hope that re, re groups do, does better in that regard 
Yeah, it's uh, it's very hard to transfer people from common networks like Facebook to our own network, uh, and hopefully this will change because it should be really helpful for our community. But uh, uh, the pri priority is the is the cooperation between or among uh, reenactment groups. So I hope that all all the different um, eras like second world war first uh, even even later wars or uh... yeah because it's not only for second world war right yeah exactly uh, it's for all 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 kind all, all types time periods. of eras. Yeah. all periods yes basically. yeah yeah so how much uh, members does uh, re reen groups have right now how much yes how many people yeah, we are. We have only about a hundred because we are just uh, making the beta version test still. But we are open for uh, for new members, and f we are trying to announce and uh, advertise our network during mm -hmm. this summer and uh, uh, early early autumn. So I hope we will grow. We also uh, edit our advertisement for in the in the Fairlock bulletins, so anybody can read more and uh, decide <laughs> whether to join or not. Well, yeah. uh, I mean the 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 uh, the first page that you have when you get into reunion groups also includes. Uh, well, I think it's a Napoleonic um, reenactment battle, so that that goes to show that it is actually for everybody uh, who is interested in or is participating in a reenactment group. Yeah, that was the main idea. We would yeah. like to uh, gather all the reenactors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's also put a link in the description below. And uh, maybe we can also do some images of reen groups in the background of this podcast. Um, yeah. I will edit that in uh, after we have done the recording. But um, let's take a step back to COP solutions because you told us that um, Cop Solutions is the the official company name um, of of yeah well let's call it Verlag Cop and that there are different branches below that right mm, yes that's right so you have uh, Cop Solutions that that's the, the the big company and then you have Werkstatt Cop and Verlag Cop which are two different branches uh, am I missing one or are those the two uh, uh, that you well, have? well there are total four branches but four, uh, okay these two are the most <laughs> let's say famous or popular <laughs> and uh, uh, the last two one of these are ring groups that's the that's the third one and uh, last is uh, militia t-shirts this oh, is yeah. the, the branch that creates uh, max t-shirts and hoodies and so on okay yeah yeah okay i understand so um uh, and you told us that werkstatt cop was more for the technical uh, things right yes um, so, so can you uh, mention some more examples of what you do through Werkstatkopf? Yeah, well, the, the main project is the Goliath project, which already takes a few years to, to oh. finish, but uh, I, I think that our community is pretty familiar with our progress. We are uh, posting pretty often. And so the Goliath project is one of the biggest. And then, then there are other projects like um, uh, Granat Werfer or uh, ammunition boxes or different, uh, mostly metal pro uh, metal products. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, I mean, I'm, I've just picked something up from my collection right now, um, which I ordered from you, which is the uh, Spring Capsule. Uh, number eight, <laughs> which also originates from uh, from there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, I've I've ordered some, quite some stuff. I've just quickly looked back, and I've been ordering from you guys since 2019. That was for I think the first time I found you guys. So, <laughs> but it's very cool that you that that, that that's also uh, a production line that you have for for the more technical aspects. I mean. Uh, how do you acquire your stuff for that? Is it something you measure up? Is it something you uh, buy originals from and then try to reproduce them? Yes, most most of the products are um, getting measurements from original pieces, mm -hmm. and most of these were acquired by buying or from collections of our group. So we always take care that the the, the 
these uh, repli- repros are accurate as much mm-hmm. as possible uh, because then you can realize that it doesn't fit fit to another type of box or some cardboard type version of box where it really needs to have proper measurements so yeah we always try to acquire original pieces and then make some magic ah cool and and the other question bjorn asked where do you get your stuff from that's that's a big question for me because i have no intention to do the same as you are doing but i'm i'm just wondering how how would you get the materials for these for this stuff mm, you mean the original pieces or the material for replication yeah the the material for replication yes <laughs> well, well that's the that's the most challenging part to find uh, proper materials <laughs> so uh, whether it's uh, some wood or metal or even canvas it's always always hard to find something uh, historically accurate and mm-hmm. we just needs to put a lot of efforts and time to search for, for it and find it finally or to make some appropriate um, reproduction yeah yeah so yeah. so does that mean that you travel around the country and try to uh, uh, get in contact with different factories who make these things yes it's one one of the one of the um, parts what you can take or we usually try to search from known sellers or or visit some local shops that offer some different uh, materials and so on yeah and i guess that if you do this quite often your network uh, increases every time and and, and it would be easier to find i think this is quite interesting because this means this means you have to travel a lot and come at places where they they might be using techniques that they would have in in the Second World War, right? How to answer this? Because it's it's not so much about traveling. You know, you can contact people now, and and with with this uh, social media and social network uh, world today, it's it's not so hard to contact someone and and uh, acquire or or request some type of material and ask if it's possible to make or produce okay so i've a bit romanticized it too much (laughs) (laughs) you went a bit too far in the past rafael (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah well i was just imagining you traveling around the country going to factories and stuff like this Uh, but (laughs) it's only sending mails and making phone calls probably (laughs) But anyway, it's it's just uh, you still have to put the effort in it. So I think you've come come very far uh, with your with your store because many of your products are quite authentic, right? Yeah, it is, and that's why, uh, also a reason why we swapped from a hobby to the real job because it's so time consuming, and that's that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. th- is this is this. Um, well, I don't know if you want to answer this question. If not, just say so. But is uh, COP Solutions uh, right now sufficient to uh, keep as a full-time job? Yeah, well, in fact, we have we have about 12 co-workers. <laughs> so so okay. we need, because you need to uh, be sufficient to, to run four branches. And for this, you need people. So there are there are more people uh, beside me that helps very much, and I'm very thankful that they are doing their jobs for keeping the history alive. Are are they employees of yours, or most are they of them, just most volunteers? of them are part time employees, and some are full time employees. Okay, okay. So that's that quite very good to hear. But I mean, that that also means that uh, we can expect. Uh, quite a bit from from Falakop in the future as well. Yeah, because if you if you check the website we have more than 400 uh, products on stock and another 300 products out of stock <laughs> so <laughs> we need people to to restock it as soon yeah. as possible. Yes, but also it has to be said that you are very accessible. Um, if 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 someone uh, tries to get in contact with with Falakop uh, you always answer immediately, at least from my experience. Uh, so when when 
when we want to get something that's out of stock, I think if I would contact you that you would uh, do your utmost best to to make something for me, right? We are trying to do our best, but uh, with the recent projects that take few months, it's sometimes impossible to react so quickly for, for smaller projects and smaller items. Uh, but yes, we are always trying to do our best to satisfy customers. Yeah, in my experience, you are doing very well uh, in that regard. So um, uh, we are uh, making use of your, um, how you call it, your your design abilities, mostly, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like the background of this uh, podcast and the banner, and also some stuff of our own uh, reenactment group, the Volkstrainerieren. You did some uh, designing on there as well. And I like it very much because when I go to somewhere in my country, in the Netherlands, to a designer and ask him about uh, these things, he probably would not understand what I, I what I needed, what I wanted. And that's the, 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 the good thing about, about you. you. You are a reenactor yourself, so you know exactly... Uh, what we want and what we need so that matches very very easily yeah and i think it's very important for uh, different reenactment groups to be able to promote themselves uh, appropriately Mm -hmm. because there are many groups that are not very uh, well known just because they don't use social media and um, good graphical styles and the, the things you need for proper advertisement. So, so it's always we are always happy to help with such graphical services. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in my opinion, you are doing very well. I'm always very sat- satisfied with your designs. So, Thank you. um, is this is this a part of Verlagkop or is this a part of the Werkstatt? <laughs> it's part of Verlagkop. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So another product which we bought from you are are the helmet bands but also the, the Heinz Denkler, Denkler booklets. Mm-hmm. I was very happy about these because uh, it al- also helps us in our group uh, with education on, on certain topics. We are, of course, mainly using the HDV, the, the Heeres Dienstvorschrift, but mm-hmm. the Heinz Denkler booklets also are a great addition to this. So I also think that's a nice uh, project uh, uh, you made. Yeah, it was one of the biggest projects. Uh, the hardest part was to collect all of these original booklets and then start reproducing them. But yes, it was it was pretty interesting. And if, uh, it was formerly produced for for uh, civil civilians, I think. But okay. if you check the content, it's all grabbed from um, official documents and official handbooks. So yeah, it's very sufficient and. Uh, suitable also for for all of us reenactors and other historians. Yeah, so I can really recommend uh, these products, these booklets. Are they still in stock? Yeah, they are. We <laughs> we currently restocked all of them, and we are just finishing the uh, melder blocks. Okay, finished. Uh, you mean mean restocking the melder blocks? Yeah, right? we are because... still rest- restocking them because we we jumped on a bigger batch, which will be about six hundred melder blocks. So it takes wow. a while, but we are finishing. <laughs> hopefully this summer. <laughs> <laughs> I I have one of your melder blocks as well, but I'm very um, careful with it because I think it's such a great item that I don't want to use it. That's that's also not good, right? <laughs> yeah, this this is sometimes the problem that the products looks very very authentic and uh, proper. That it's shame to to damage it. Yeah, yeah. So, what is the product you are most proud of as of right now? I think that you already mentioned it. It it will be the Spring Capsule Number Eight <laughs> package. Ah, the this one is which very, Bjorn bought. Yeah, very yeah. very popular. <laughs> But uh, I can also strongly recommend products of our partners, which is Leatherwerk and Geronimo US Reproduction, which are very highly rated by customers. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. I, I also ordered a, yeah, a, a, a um, how do you call it? Uh, a Riemen for, uh, for a... Uh, equipment. Yeah, for my equipment from you guys. But just as, as to see what it was like to mm-hmm. hold it in my hands, and uh, I'm very happy with it. I mean, it's nice thick leather, and it has a nice uh, uh, finish. So yeah, 
Oh, yeah. that's it's really good. Bjorn is always someone who who buys stuff uh, to see how it is, how it looks <laughs> like. If if he's if he's satisfied satisfied about it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's that stems from the fact that uh, uh, when I started out, there was a lot of stuff that was looked great on the picture, and when you had it in your hands, mm -hmm. um, it looked it, it was an abomination. I think that's the uh, that's the best word to describe it. But I've always been happy with the, with the stuff coming from you guys. I've just picked up the entire selection of booklets that I bought from you guys, including two uh, Soldaten and Lieder Buchen, mm -hmm. uh, which I which are also slowly wearing down because I've used them. <laughs> yeah, this is mandatory mandatory item in our packets. So that only their book uh, mm -hmm. heft and so yeah. we always think uh, on events. Yeah. yeah, we should do that more. We really should. But it's, uh, it's difficult to get into the group. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, because we are uh, all already quite far into the podcast, uh, we need to go on. I, I want to give you the last chance to put one of your products in spotlights. Which product would you put in spotlights? Uh, it's Tragschlaufe project for sure. It's very interesting packaging box that had a very complex path of implementation. And uh, this one is finishing just this summer. And we are also looking forward to own Zoldbook series in the very near future, maybe in mm. the near autumn already so this this one is the most interesting correct okay so so the you mean empty salt buche well we are playing with option that also the filling of salt book will be a part of our new services so maybe okay. it's possible okay but that's quite a big project as well because I know we have been looking into that as well and are still busy with filling it in. Um, but it's a, a, a difficult process. <laughs> yeah, every group struggles with this uh, situation yeah. to start filling salt books. And that's why we decided that maybe it will be a bit helpful for others to uh, make some service that will prefill some of the pages for the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Interesting. Well, it almost sounds like a, a new podcast item, uh, Rafael. Uh, just, just to 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 jump in uh, for the small tidbits that you need uh, as an reenactor, and then also highlight this part to actually for people who are not familiar with the salt book itself, uh, what the intricacies are, and then then yeah. you can really understand why it's it's such a big uh, uh, um, project for for Lachkopf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've been busy with researching parts of this with uh, Shurt, who has been in our podcast as well. Um, yeah, uh, at a certain time, we were stuck on, I don't know what it's called, but these numbers. Um, Wehrnummer. What, what did you say? Wehrnummer. Yeah, yeah, for example, the Wehrnummers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was quite difficult to get that uh, on an authentic level. But as Bjorn said, we can fill on a whole podcast about that topic alone. <laughs> but that's not uh, what we're here for. Um, I, I still want to ask more questions about Verlagkop. And, and one of the questions I also have is, uh, what are the challenges you face with Verlagkop? Do you get a lot of criticism from the community, uh, uh, shipment problems, or other things I haven't thought about? Well, I need to say that our customers are the best in the world. And I can't even remember when we got the bad rating. People understand that uh, for customized products, there is a waiting queue. And they also understand that uh, to our sending packages only once a week. But uh, for criticism, we are always uh, ready. And uh, we would like to hear more of criticism to uh, update our products, of course. And we have very, very few shipment problems. Maybe once or twice a year, there is some uh, missing package. There are always some delayed packages because of the whole pandemic situation, but that's something between uh, the, the delivery company mm -hmm. and, and customer. And But we are always trying to do our best. And I think that customers really appreciate this. But what is really challenging is uh, delivery times of our subcontractors because this is sometimes very stressful and we always need to postpone some project realizations due to these manners. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, uh, what what we receive on our end with stuff coming uh, later because of uh, uh, supply issues through the mail and everything else and, 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 and delivery services, I think you are facing the exact same thing, but then on the uh, your supplier end. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that the producer of the of the raw materials is uh, is is having delays. Yeah. Okay, so that's your b- biggest challenge as of now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, also, what I want to ask about the shipment problems. Uh, that's that's why I asked it. Is that I have noticed, we have noticed, John and I, mm-hmm. that packages from the United States have become increasingly um, expensive. And I have also read on Facebook uh, people from the United States which said the same about products from Europe. Is that something you have to deal with or is that something you barely noticed? I would say that we barely notice it because we mostly ship uh, worldwide by our national uh post carrier and this is uh, this one is keeping his prices uh pretty low and with pretty good results so okay. we are always happy to to cooperate with them and uh, no i i haven't noticed any any big uh, changes in shipping costs okay so the people from the united states can still order your products for for the same shipment costs as before yes okay it, well it, it, it is stable for at least last four years or last maybe hmm. five years oh, that's, that's interesting good. for for if there are people listening to us from across the ocean i think there are not many of them but uh well <laughs> you never know <laughs> you never know indeed and, and well then they should know that they can still order your product for the same uh, price then the the last question we have um uh, for you is about something we talked about in another uh, dutch spoken episode because uh, we talked about that a lot of reenactment uh, uh, shops are uh, located in former Warsaw Pact countries. So uh, countries like Poland, uh, Slovakia, Ukraine, and, and, and stuff like that. And um, um, we were thinking that that's the reason, the reason for that is that because the craftsmanship in these countries survived for much longer in Eastern Europe. Um, do you think that this is a correct assumption we have? Do you agree with us? Well, I was thinking about this a while, but I can't I can't be so sure about this uh, phenomenon because I agree that there are many uh, skilled and handy people, mm-hmm. but what is the reason for these people? Maybe maybe the reason is that the in the people that lived in industrialized parts of Slovakia keep their machines and their knowledge and they use it pretty often so the knowledge is still there some somewhere in the locations but i can i can't say for sure what is the reason that this eastern part is quite still manufacturing items at a, at a high level that that's the, the the main reason because uh we all know the famous storm articles from miltech uh, they were produced here in the West, and their quality is much lower than what you get from the Eastern side. That's why we were so curious about it. Yeah, because we are also buying a lot of stuff from your competition, uh, uh, like Schuster's. Um, um, Bjorn, help me. What what do we have uh, more? A replic? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Vincent's equipment? And, and uh, from some guy somewhere in the backwaters of Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, what's his Neumann. name again? Neumann, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's something that we noticed that all these good shops are located in the east, but as of yet, there's no clear explanation for this, at least from your side. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can always see the difference, uh, even on the on the products like leather. Uh, we use our own local leathers mm-hmm. and uh, when you order from Sturm, I can't say uh, where they, their leather comes from, but there is a big difference uh, on the outcome when, yes. you, when you compare it. Uh, in our case, you, you can be sure that we use our local sources and then the leather is quality. And I think that uh, these Western companies are more, more closed uh, for the information they gave about their pro- products 
and you can only rely on the photos and it's yeah part of the problem okay. yeah yeah so well we keep uh, ordering our stuff from the east because it's still the best <laughs> <laughs> so are there uh, we have come to the end of uh, uh, this episode are there any other topics you want to discuss with us no, maybe I would like to thank you for inviting me to your podcast and emphasize the importance of what you are doing for the community. community. Uh, and lastly, I would like to invite all your listeners to Ring Group Social Network to cooperate and share their reenacting experiences. It, it will be really nice to see you all together on one place. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that. Let's do that. Uh, indeed, uh, as we said before, we will put all the links in the description. It has mm -hmm. been uh, very nice to have you uh, here with us, uh, Patrick. Um, it also has given us some insight in uh, your side of the story, uh, the, the story of the web shop owner and how it goes on that side. So it has given us quite some information. And for that, I also want to say if there are listeners that have more questions about this, uh, yeah, just put it in the comments below. And um, if I see a question that I can't answer, I will forward it to Patrick <laughs> and um, <laughs> try to get an answer. Um, so, shall we agree on that? <laughs> sure, sure. I'm always <laughs> ready to answer. Okay. So, then I'm uh, going to end uh, this podcast. Um, uh, again, I want to thank all our listeners um, for listening to our podcast and I also want to ask them that if they like our podcast to like and subscribe to our channel um, I have to say we are mainly a Dutch spoken channel and occasionally we will put English episodes out like this but mm -hmm. it's not our, our main business um, but anyway if you want to sub subscribe it would help us a lot um, for more information about all the things we talked about in this podcast, you can look in the description below. Uh, for example, the websites of Verlagkopf, uh, the website of Rian Groups, but also the website of the group where Patrick is a member of, KVH Veldkrau, and of course our own group, uh, Die Volksgrenadieren, which is located in the Netherlands. And then, once again, thanks for listening and see you next time. <laughs>